Well, good morning. Good to see you all here today. <clears throat> if you got Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 4. We continue our study in this book. Let me ask you a question. I already know the answer, but it's fun to uh, throw it out anyway. Anybody ever have a bad day? You know, like when the Broncos don't make the uh, playoffs? That's a bad day. Or you open the news or however you get your news and you read that a uh, general manager has drafted an uh, old uh, quarterback that's supposed to save us. I know, it's controversial. Is that a bad day? There's, there's bad days. There's things that happen. We all have gone through them. And as we read 1 Samuel chapter 4 today, as I read this, I had one thing going through my mind. Because you had a bad day, you're taking one down. I mean, this, folks, is a bad day. And I want you to see how it is that even in the midst of this bad day, or you know the truth is any bad day, yours and mine included, God is still on the throne, amen? God is still in control, and God has a plan. He's able to take the things in this life that the enemy and just our own flesh wants to use for destruction and discouragement, and God's able to turn those things around for our good and his glory. Do you believe that this morning? Amen? Let's read this together. Let's see how this all plays out, because as we start 1 Samuel chapter 4, we are going to pick it up from where we left off last week in 1 Samuel 3. And the first thing we read is, and Samuel's word came to all Israel. Now, stop there, because we're not going to hear anything from Samuel again until about chapter 7 of this book, which chronologically is about 20 years later. Now, we don't know why we don't hear anything about Samuel, whom the book is named for, but the truth is, what we're going to turn to is the enemies of the Lord, called the Philistines. And we're going to see how it is that the enemies of the Lord used the Philistines to fulfill God's word, both to Eli when he gave it a couple of Sundays ago, as we read that in 1 Samuel, what, I think chapter 2, as well as then to Samuel as God confirmed it to him. And remember I said, whenever God speaks, God can always speak and confirm he confirms. He says it again through a different source, through a different avenue, through a different means. God speaks. And it's not this idea if you miss it once, you know, you're out of luck. God will continue to confirm. If anybody ever comes up to me and says, Brandon, God told me that he wants you to. <laughs> I, I love it when I hear that. God told me he wants you to. And I always respond with, well, let me pray about that because if God wants me to, he's going to confirm that to me too. Are you telling me? Are you with me? I mean, that's how it works. And so God spoke. He told Eli through an anonymous prophet what was going to happen. He confirms it to Samuel, the up-and-coming prophet. And remember, the, uh, the word that he had to say was not a soft and gentle, cuddly word. It was coming judgment and coming doom. In fact, you remember, he told this anonymous prophet told Eli that his two sons were going to die on the same day. And along with that, he and his family line, Eli and his family line, would be removed from being priests in God's house. So we're not told how much time passes from that word of judgment and what we read today. And you know what? If that had been important in terms of chronology and time, the Holy Spirit would have inspired the writer of 1 Samuel to include that. But the truth is, this is the word that we need to see and the word that we need to ask. And the question I have is this. In this time frame from when God spoke to Eli through this anonymous prophet, all the way up until what we read today, however many years this was in terms of elapsing, I would ask the question, why didn't Eli do something about it? I mean, if you had an honest prophet come to you and tell you, your kids are nuts, you need to rein them in, and you, frankly, aren't doing much better yourself, don't you think you might want to say, hey, then what do I need to change? What do I need to do differently? 
Don't you think you might want to repent and ask God, hey, please, Lord, if there's any way, if there's any way at all that this could pass, if we could do this differently, if you could spare my son's lives, I'm going to address it. I'm going to confront it. I'm going <clears> to <throat> encourage them to repent. I'm going to ask them to change. And if they don't, God, then I'll remove them. But please, is there any way? And you know what? What you don't see is any of that. I was reminded of Abraham. Remember when God told Abraham what he was going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah? He said, you know, these people are wicked and I'm going to wipe it out. What did Abraham do? Did Abraham say what Eli said? Well, that's the Lord. And if that's what he wants to do, that's all I can do. Nothing I can do about it. No, Abraham said, but Lord, if there be 50, would you spare it for 50? Yeah, okay, if I find 50 good people in Sodom, then I'll spare it. Well, but Lord, what if you find 40, 30, 20? Abraham kept coming to the Lord and asking him, will you change your mind? Would, would you do this any different? Could you spare? Could you show grace? Could you show mercy? And you don't see Eli doing that at all. No brokenness, no repentant heart. Maybe he thought God would forget. Maybe he thought the word of the prophet was wrong. But you don't see any of that. And you know what? We read, here's how it goes down in verse 2. Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel. And as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 of the Israelites of them on the battlefield. And it says, when the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord bring defeat upon us today before the Philistines? Now, historically speaking, this is helpful. The Philistines are mentioned in scripture as early as the time of Abraham. And as we read first and second Samuel, the Philistines will be mentioned over 150 times. These are the enemies of God. They lived along the coast of the Mediterranean, down on that southeast or southwest section of Palestine. And as soon as the Israelites showed up to take the promised land as Joshua led them in, as soon as the Israelites showed up, the Philistines, they fought hard. They had five main cities. And they didn't want any of their land taken by the Israelites. And so they will continue to be the enemies of the Israelites. In fact, you remember the study of Judges? You remember what we're told about how the Lord used the Philistines to judge his people? Back in Judges 13.1, we read, in the, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So, it says, the Lord delivered them into the hands of the who? This was back in the time of the Judges. God used these same Philistines for 40 years to oppress his people to get them to cry out. And you remember that the Lord raised up a certain character in the book of Judges. His name was Samson. In fact, Judges 13.5 says, He, Samson, will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. He will begin. Now, he didn't ultimately accomplish that task. He did not rid Israel of the Philistines. We will find that David, years later when he becomes king, David will be responsible to rid the land of the Philistines, but it says Samson began and it's not finished yet. These enemies of the Lord were the enemies of the Lord's people. And this would have been one of many battles that the Israelites fought with this people group. And as we're told, this particular battle doesn't go very well, does it? No, we're told the Israelites were defeated and about 4,000 soldiers were killed. And like any time bad things happen, our natural tendency is, especially those of us that know the Lord, when bad things happen, a natural human tendency is to turn and to ask, why God? Why did you allow this? Anybody ever asked why God? Anybody had that inquiry on their lips when something bad happens in life? Why did this happen? Why did God allow this to happen? Now, their particular words sounded very similar. They said specifically, back in verse 3, why did the Lord, I like how he, they point right to him, why did the Lord bring defeat upon us today before the Philistines? Now, again, we can all relate to the focus 
of our problems and difficulties being directed at the Lord. He was supposed to protect us. He was supposed to take care of us. God was supposed to lead us. God was supposed to guide us. God was supposed to provide for us. We hear it all the time. When bad things happen, when we have bad days, sometimes in our flesh we turn and we look at God as if he is holy and solely responsible. But you know, isn't it funny how when things go south in our lives, we go all Adam and Eve on God? I mean, that, that, I turned that into a verb. It's to go Adam and Eve, right? Did you just hoover that? You can say that about your own last name. Turn it into a verb. They, they all went Adam and Eve on God. You know what Adam and Eve did when they were caught in sin? What did each one of them do? God came to Adam and he said, it was Eve. And Eve, he came to her and she said, it was the serpent. It had nothing to do with them. It had everything to do with somebody else, right? And that's very human. That's very sinful in our view of life and problems. It's his fault. It's her fault. It's your fault. And you know what? Oftentimes, folks, the last place we ever look is right back at ourselves. The last place we ever take onus, the, where we take responsibility, is to stop and to ask what David did. I love what David did. Search me and know me and see if there be any wicked way in me. That's the heart of somebody who is introspective. That's the heart of somebody who knows that in humanity, when a husband and a wife fight, guess who's completely responsible? Both of you. <laughs> it's never a hundred and zero. It's always part on each person. The, one of the biggest things in conflict resolution that they teach us, especially as pastors, if we're going to try and mediate between husbands and wives and, and different individuals, I mean, I would never have wanted to be Moses. Are you kidding me? All day and night, mediating between people? But the biggest thing that conflict resolution teaches you is to try and get people to own up for their percentage. Because whenever there's an argument, we always think it's 90% the other person or maybe 100% the other person and maybe 1% or 2% me. No, but if you can get somebody to own up for what they think is their 1% or 2%, the other person hears them owning up for what they believe to be 100%, right? It's not a trick. The truth is it's just people taking responsibility for what they've done. And when it comes to the Israelites, folks, if the elders had recalled the terms of God's covenant, they would have realized that this shameful defeat was actually caused by Israel's disobedience to God's law. Because I want you to notice in this story how the people of God, after their defeat at the hands of the Philistines, they ask no questions about their own attitudes, their own behaviors, even their own strategy. God gave them a clear way to approach a battle. In fact, he said in Leviticus 26, verse 14, but if you will not listen to me and carry out all of these commands, if, he says, you reject my decrees and abhor my laws and fail to carry out all my commands and so violate my covenant, if you don't obey me, God says in verse 17, I will set my face against you so that you will be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you, and you will flee even when no one is pursuing you. And so really, this is a simple look at the people of God reaping what they sowed, right? They were disobeying God's law. They were disobeying God's covenant. In fact, more than just disobeying, folks, they flat out rejected God's word. They rejected God's will. And the Israelites rejected God's ways. They altogether rejected it. We don't want anything to do with it. We're going to go our own way, and we're going to do our own thing. And I want to encourage you how important it is <clears throat> to look inward at times when we're experiencing pain and difficulty. It's not always the case. It's not always at fault with you. But in many cases, it's a good place to start, wouldn't you agree? Lord, am I guilty of anything in this? Lord, have I contributed in any way to this situation that's happening? 
Uh, so often people find themselves in difficult situations, and if they look back and they trace their steps, they can look where they decided to do something that was contrary to God's word and God's will and God's ways. And that's exactly where these people were. But not only was their attitude messed up, I want you to see how their strategy was equally as messed up. Verse 3, 1 Samuel 4. Let us, here was their approach. They got beat at the hands of the Philistines. So now their strategy is this. Let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh, the tabernacle, so that it may go well with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. Sounds like a great plan, they think to themselves. So it says in verse 4, the people sent men back to Shiloh. And they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came into the camp, all Israel, it says, raised such a great shout that the ground shook. So they were excited, right? We brought the Ark of the Covenant, the, the presence of God, into our camp. In fact, verse 6, hearing the uproar of the Israelites, it says the Philistines asked, what's all this sh shouting in the Hebrew camp? And when they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come into the Israelite camp, the Philistines were afraid. A God has come into the camp, they said. We're in trouble. Nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the desert. These are the Philistines now. They hear this uproar in the Israelite camp, and the ground shakes. And the Israelites, they are excited and the Philistines now, because of all of this tumult and uproar, are afraid. And then they rehearse some of what they heard about the Israelites' God. They are the gods, even though they call them gods, because that's how they worshipped. They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the desert. Be strong, Philistines. Here's their response. Be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you will be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. How long did we look back in Judges that they had been subject to the Philistines, the Israelites? Forty years, right? So now the Philistines are saying, hey guys, unless you are really strong and fight hard, we're going to be subject to them just as we subjected them to us. Be men and fight. <laughs> that, that just goes on a poster, right? Be men and fight. That, that's the salvo. Be men and fight. So it says... The Philistines fought. I like that. So the Philistines fought. And the Israelites were what? They were defeated. And every man fled to his tent. The slaughter of the Israelites was very great. Israel lost not just 4,000 men this time, but Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. Not only that, the ark of God was captured. And oh, by the way, just as the prophet told Eli, However many years before, Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, did what? They took a dirt nap, right? Just as the prophet said they would. Now let me just stop. Anybody see anything wrong with that approach to hopeful victory the second time around? Here's what they said. Hey, we lost, so let's get the ark and bring it out of the Holy of Holies where it's supposed to reside, covered by a blanket so that nobody except for the high priest once a year can go in and see the ark. Yeah, let's go ahead and bring that ark and let's bring it into the camp. And hey, you know what? Why don't we ask the upstanding priests, Hophni and Phinehas, to go ahead and escort God into the camp so that we can win our next battle. Anybody hear anything at all wrong with that whole strategy? Well, there is a whole lot wrong with that strategy because realize the Lord had told them clearly how they're supposed to fight their wars, and he told them clearly in his word, if only they were seeking and listening to God's word. Back in Deuteronomy 20, here's what God told them to do when they go into battle. 
when you go to war, verse 1, against your enemies, and when you see horses and chariots and an army greater than yours, this was the case, don't be afraid of them because why? The Lord, your God, <laughs> he's with you. The Lord, your God, who brought you up out of Egypt, we, he will be with you. And when you're about to go into battle, the priest, hear this, the priest, that would be Eli in this case, he shall come forward and the priest shall address the army. The priest shall say, hear, O Israel, today you're going into battle against your enemies. Don't be faint-hearted or afraid. Don't be terrified or give way to panic before the enemy. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. Now, that's pretty clear cut, wouldn't you agree? Where was the priest? Where was Eli? Where was this declaration to the army? Instead, we see a whole other thing happening. Hey, let's go get the Ark of the Covenant, which was the symbol. If you've been reading through the Old Testament with us, through the Bible in a year, we just finished reading all about the, the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle and how it was supposed to be and how it was made. We, we saw all of that. In fact, here's a picture of the Ark, what it would have looked like. Can we get that on the big screen too? Here's the Ark. God had them make this specifically, and these are the poles that were slid through, and that's how they were supposed to carry the ark. Here's the two cherubim on top. This is the bema seat. This is where God, when he came and when he would speak to the high priest, that's where the Shekinah glory of God would reside. So this was a very powerful vessel, but folks, inside of this, by the way, was what? Was the law, the the those stone tablets, right? Along with, we know, Aaron's budding uh, staff and, and some manna as well. This was meant to be a reminder of God's power, but folks, this isn't the power of God. God is the power of God, yeah? And they thought, well, let's get the symbol. That's God with us. All the while, they were disobeying everything God told them to do. They were winging it, in fact. <laughs> they did their own thing. And I want you to hear, when it comes to our God, God is not a good luck charm. And God is not someone who will always do our bidding as we see fit. He's not a lucky rabbit's foot. He's not a genie in a bottle that can be used for our own desires. And folks, as you're going to see instead, or as we did see, instead of actually bringing the ark into the camp and having it go well for the people, now we're going to win it actually does the reverse, doesn't it? It actually fires up the Philistines so much that they go out and they defeat not just 4,000 like the first battle, but now they defeat 30,000 of the Israelite foot soldiers. Wow, what a complete antithesis of what they were hoping would happen. The Ark of God, Hophni and Phinehas, here we go. <laughs> but if you think that's all there is to a bad day, just wait because it gets worse. We read in verse 12, that same day, a Benjamite ran from the battle line and went to Shiloh, his clothes torn and dust on his head. And when he arrived, there was Eli, the priest, nowhere in the battle like he should have been, addressing the army like he should have been. Instead, Eli is back in Shiloh, and when he arrived, he was sitting on his chair by the side of the road watching because his heart feared for the ark of God. And when the man, the messenger, entered the town and told what had happened to the townspeople, the whole town sent up a cry. They were heartbroken about this. And so it says, Eli heard the outcry, and he asked, what's the meaning of this uproar? And the man hurried over to Eli, who was 98 years old, and whose eyes were set so that he couldn't see. And he told Eli, I've just come from the battle line. I fled from it this very day. So what happened in the battle, the second one? Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they died, right? This same day, a messenger runs back to the town of Shiloh, tells the people, and then gets to telling Eli. Eli asks, what happened to my son? And the man, verse 17, who brought the news, he replied, Israel fled before the Philistines, and the army has suffered heavy losses 
Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. Now read this. When, the, when, the, when he mentioned the ark of God, it says, Eli fell backward off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken, and he died. For he was an old man, and he was heavy, and he led Israel 40 years. Folks, does that sound like a bad day? I, we're, I'm not done. It's not done. There's more. Because look at verse 19. And then it says, his daughter-in-law, the wife of Phineas, right? Hophni and Phineas. She was pregnant and near the time of delivery. And when she heard the news that the ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth but was overcome by her labor pains. And as she was dying, the woman attending her said, Don't despair, you have given birth to a son. But she didn't respond or pay any attention. She named the boy Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because of the capture of the ark of God and the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband. She said, The glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. Wow. Because you had a bad day, you're taking one down, you sing a sad song just to turn it around. Folks, that's a bad day. The Israelites are routed in battle, 4,000 soldiers die. The Ark of the Covenant is captured by the Philistines. 30,000 more, so a total of 34,000 soldiers. Read that, wives now widowed. Read that, sons and daughters with no father. Read that, leaders gone, soldiers destroyed. <laughs> Hophni and Phinehas die. That was the work of the Lord. Eli hears the news, and that same day he dies. And then Eli's daughter-in-law dies while giving birth when she hears of her husband and father-in-law. Can it get any worse? <laughs> Probably the most tragic thing of all of this is the glory of the Lord had departed from Israel. The glory which represents the presence and the power of the Lord, we're told, left Israel. That's what Ichabod means. The glory has departed, God's presence. And that's probably the saddest and most desperate place any person can be when God is no longer with you. Why? How did we get to this place? All because of their sin and their sinful ways, doing their own thing, and going their own way. I'm going to say it like this, folks. They didn't fear the Lord, did they? That's what you see, is the people of God, the leaders of God, no longer fearing the God that they were supposed to be serving. They no longer feared Him and His Word. They no longer feared His power. They no longer feared what might happen if they sinned against him and disobeyed. And that's a crazy place to be when you no longer fear the God of all the universe. And you know what? Fear, the Bible says, is the beginning of wisdom. To fear God Almighty. Not in a way like God is going to destroy me, necessarily, even though... But instead, as followers of Jesus Christ, a healthy fear and awe and reverence of God and who he is. You see, one of the things I think, and I listen to songs and, and I read scripture and I read devotionals and, and you know, I'm, I'm, I try and stay abreast of the, the Christian community and the books that are being written and all the rest. And I love the fact, because I'm the same way, I'm a grace guy. I love the grace of God. Anybody else love the grace of God? Anybody else want to just camp on the grace of God? People come in, and I'm a loser. I've sinned so much, and I'm like, you know what? God loves you. He has grace for you. There's forgiveness. There's mercy. I love the grace, and we sing songs about grace. We sing songs about mercy. We sing about God's forgiveness and his all of those things, but folks, I think sometimes we too can run the risk of saying, well, you know what? God is so gracious, so what does it matter if I, if I do this? I, there's forgiveness on the other side of this sin. I, I'm okay. I'm a grace guy. And so, you know what? It's okay because I read how God will forgive. But you know what? I think that's a dangerous thing to do. Because, yes, God's grace 
will take care of condemnation. Jesus took your condemnation and mine for our sin. But when we, like they, become cavalier about sin, when we, like they, don't even mind ourselves about sin and we just live in this grace like, it's okay, God will forgive, where is a healthy fear of God Almighty? Because, yes, grace will take care of condemnation. But guess what grace won't take care of? Grace doesn't take care of consequences. Grace doesn't take care. And you say, well, I'm forgiven. Uh, yeah, I, I cheated on my husband, but I'm forgiven. Well, that's fine. You can be forgiven. There is no sin that can't be forgiven. But guess won't be, what, what won't be taken care of are the consequences of our sin. You see, even if Eli, back to this story, even if Eli had said, but Lord, I, I, I know I've done wrong, and I know that I've let my sons run amok. If there's any way, God, that you can change your mind, if there's any way I'm going to deal with this, I'm going to repent. You know what? They're going to repent. Who knows? I mean, maybe God would have changed the consequence, but you know what? He didn't. And the reality is, folks, the consequences are some of the most difficult things we ever have to deal with. Losing the trust of people around us. L lo losing your marriage in the case of the wife cheating on the husband. Stealing something and people seeing you. Getting caught in sin in a way. And you know what? You can't take back some of those things. There are consequences that grace doesn't have anything to do with. Grace covers the sin, but the consequence is still there. We have to deal with consequences in this life. You hurt people. People are going to see you. You, you, you. you have a cavalier nature towards sin. Yeah, I know God loves us. God forgives us. But I, I read this story and I just think, where's the healthy fear of God? Where's the fear of the Lord and what might happen that causes us to live consequentially? Charles and I, on Tuesday, when we have our staff meeting and we met and we talked through this sermon, I said that very thing. I said, what I see here is people who were not living consequentially. I, I read this story and I say, where are people who realize there are consequences in life? And some of those consequences can be avoided if on the front end we say no to sin. Yeah, we can be forgiven on the back end, but I don't want to just be forgiven. I want to have grace on the front end to say no to sin so I don't have to deal with these kind or even other kinds of consequences. Anybody agree with me? Anybody see what it is I'm trying to say. <laughs> Maybe I'm not saying it the right way. But to live consequentially. To live in light of what might happen. And say, you know what, it's not worth it. It's not worth it to go down that path. Lord, I don't want to hurt myself. I don't want to hurt others. I don't want to have my reputation tarnished. No, God, I, I'm going to choose to go the other way. I'm going to choose to obey your word. I'm going to choose to trust you. And trust what you've told us to do. And in all of that, guess what? We are able to avoid these kind and other kinds of bad days. Amen? Because, yeah, bad days can happen when they happen to us, when you can't do anything about it. But when the bad days are on account of us, and we look and we say, wow, this day was horrible. Yeah, well, you did this, you did this, you did this, and you did this. That's why at the end of the day, this day has been so bad. What if you had said no to this, and no to this, and no to this, and no to this? Then instead of singing, because you had a bad day, you might be singing a whole different tune of God's goodness and God's love. Amen? Father, we pray that you would help us grasp a hold of the truth that's here. That we might understand just exactly what it is that you're saying to each and every one, and I know your spirit is capable. And so as we close this chapter, this very bad day in the life of Israel, this very bad day in the life of Eli and his two sons, this very bad day for the soldiers, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be the kind of people that look at our own lives first, take responsibility, and on the front end, say no to those things that will lead us in a bad day. We want to have good days. We want to have days that are full of joy and full of peace, full of hope and full of love. And so, Lord, we pray that you would check each one of our spirits. 
you would challenge each one of us and that you would show by the power of your spirit those things that we need to say no to. How it is we need to obey your word and follow in your will, in your word, and your ways. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.